Amen. Please take your seat. I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to welcome you. If this is the first time you're here, that you're here with me, you are welcome. You are welcome. This is going to be bothering me. Oh, this, this pulpit has to be Latin because it moves. Oh, it's because on top of those boxes. Okay. This day, I will share with you uh, regarding Jesus' resurrection. But also, before talking about the events of the resurrection, I would like to say, where was Jesus? In other words, Jesus passes. And the third day he's resurrected. And what were they, was he doing between the time he passed and the moment he resurrects? So I want to make reference to that part. And then I'm gonna we're gonna read Luke chapter twenty four, verses one through twelve. In first Peter chapter three verse eighteen to twenty two. First Peter chapter three verse eighteen to twenty two. For Christ also has hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Here we have the objective of crucifixion and death. That's the objective. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. By which also, for which sometimes were disobedient when once in the long suffering of God waited. So, it brings, it shows us the objective, the reason why Jesus passed, dies to forgive sins. Because Jesus, the just, and I'm going to amplify a little more here. And to be just, you have to be obedient. If you're not obedient, you're not being justful. And that's why I'm going to go back to Genesis. That's why Adam, Adam was perfect. He wasn't just. He was perfect. He wasn't just. Adam, you know, for him to be just, he had to obey. That's why God gave him one simple commitment. Don't eat of the fruit. <clears> or <throat> two trees. So that in order for God to be, Adam to turn, sorry, to be just, he had to obey to God. Are you with me? Amen? Adam was perfect, but not just. To be just, you have to obey. Adam was disobedient. Therefore, he's categorized unjustice. Adam is created in the image of God. We are to the image of Adam because chapter 5 of Genesis says because it says that Adam and Eve had sexual relationships and they had children according to their image. The only one created to the image of God was Adam. The other ones, we are the image of our grandparents. And our first grandparent was Adam. First grandfather was Adam, first grandmother Eve. Therefore, unfortunately, we take the image of our grandparents, Adam and Eve. And we're not justice, and we're unjustice, we're disobedient. Amen. What terrible category, huh? We start in the world without taking advantage and we're already not on justice. 
But God in his love sends another. God humbles himself and becomes man. Takes a body just like yours. God humbles himself and comes inside a body and his name is Jesus Christ. This Jesus Christ obeyed what God told him, asked him to do. Because he obeyed, he is justice. Or just. If Jesus would have been if Jesus if Jesus would have disobeyed at once, the death at the cross would have no value. Jesus Christ did not even disobey once. Remember, Adam disobeyed only once. But Jesus did not even was disobedient not even once. Therefore, he is justice. Just. When he dies, when he's nailed, they whip him, they put the crown of spin. All of that blood that was shedding from his body, it's an innocent blood. Pure blood. Just blood. A blood that is just. That blood, it redeems you. It redeems you. In other words, Jesus' blood pays for my sin. Jesus paid the debt of my sin because I believe in Jesus. The moment you believe in Jesus, you become unjust to just. Are you with me? Because I am in Christ. Just like you are in your inside this building. To believe in Christ is to be in Christ. To be in Christ before God's eyes. We're just. Not perfect. Just. But I'm just because. Not because I'm obedient all the time. I'm just because I believe by faith. Are we clear? Say amen. Because I don't want to start again. Amen. Thank you. So Jesus dies, and this is what he has wished. When he dies, First Peter says that he descends. He doesn't go up, he ascends, he descends. Where does he go? He goes and visits spirits in, in prison, people that disobeyed, that didn't believe in Jesus. The Bible says, Talk to us about a place of torment, a horrible place, eternally horribly. He who rejects the sacrifice of Jesus, which is what the greatest God has done for us, he cannot give more. He gave the maximum. He who rejects Jesus, unfortunately, his place would be a place of torment. And I hope that no one here, amen, would go to that place of torment because there's no need for, to be in that place of torment remember that I told you you don't have to be perfect let's believe you just have to believe as believing you're just you're justified now let's go back to the Sunday here we find the story finding the f four Gospels but I'm going to look at Luke 24, chapter 24, starting with verse 1. It reads this way. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Isn't it true that women, let me tell you, if it wasn't for women, this place would be this place would be so dry. We're so little to take pictures to prepare parties or celebrations. May God bless the women. Do we say amen or no? Of course we do. They're the ones who say this date will be take a picture, family picture. Dress this way, dress that way. And prepare parties and do a lot of 
a lot of beautiful things that women do. They truly do. And we see that women, in the, the in Jesus' time, they're the same. They're worried about their body of a dead. Where are the men? None of the apostles, of his disciples, is among them. So what was Peter doing? Who knows? Probably snoring. But the stories of the Bible are so very dynamic. There is a lot of this in the stories. And they're so similar to you. That's why it is impactful. They're impacting. So the women go and they have prepared. And they get to the place. Verse 2 says, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, and bow down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Now let's stop here for a moment. Trying to be in, in this story. The difference, the disadvantage that we have now, is that we know the end of the story. Isn't it true? But try to Put yourself in that scene. The day before you made the preparations, you bought the spices, the spices, you woke up morning, the, early in the morning. You probably didn't even sleep that night because you're thinking about what you have to do for the body of someone that you learned to love. A good man, a good person, very different to every other person you've known. You still are living the trauma of what you saw. You saw how they treat this man. You know what he, that he was betrayed for some. All of this is in your mind. And now that you think you're going to go and visit that body and, and bathe him with the spices because that's part of your faith. And you get there You're not scared because the stone was removed or rolled away. But you enter and maybe you feel, you know, relief that you don't have to move the stone because the work's already done. But now when you enter, you're like, whoa, where's the body? Who took it? Why did they take it? Who would want to take the body? But in this confusion... Two men appear, dressed in white with a shiny garment. Now this brings fear upon you. All the emotions that are inside of this story, this is real. That's why it, this Bible stories touch really deep inside of us. Because we have lived, we have been in situations that we have received bad news. We're still dealing with the bad news. We have seen th things that we're dealing with what we have seen. Some of them have lived through traumatic things. And then we start to enter something and confusion starts. And now we have fear. And that is how these women are found. And now... These angels, they say the following. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Implying. The question is like implying. You should know that he's alive. And that the living are not among the dead. Don't live among the dead. We're clear? 
part of the teaching of Jesus. I'm going to die. Just like Jonah was fed out of the mouth of the fish, the, dirt, the earth would do the same with me. Sometimes we receive some truths that we ignore. And then at the moment when it precisely comes, something wakes up, something clicks of what was told we were told before. So these women are there. He's not here. But is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again now I want to talk about this a little Jesus God better yet saying God knew because he knows everything what would move what moves the men in the temple at that time you remember when Jesus went into, into the occasion and he turned the tables over of those that were doing business the whole system there was based on this money silver priests used to live from the silver money that was coming collecting from the temple that's why Karl Marx said that religion is the opium of the people that's why there's a lot of people rejects religion because they're always, through generations, is he who sees the people like cows, trying to milk them, milking them, getting money out. Others look at the church members as dollar signs. Chiching, chiching, chiching. And God knew the, the spirit are those men who live in the temple and God used that evil spirit so those sinners would crucify the son of man son of God God knows us God knows what motivates us what wakes up what inspires us what pushes us God knows that now see Since son of man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day you rise again. The story doesn't end there. When the men are done with you, that's when God intervenes. His hand goes in. When you get to the end of everything, when you've reached your max of all your glory, all your resources are done. That's when God in, in, intercedes with his invisible hand because the world finishes with the people. The world, it's like a machine that chews and chews and chews, drains you all your energy, everything, and then spits you out. I remember years ago, a friend of mine, Eduardo Estevez, told me that in Argentina, he's, Argent he's Argentine, in Argentina, when they wanted to sell your car, they had to put a sign, never a taxi. And I asked him why. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? No, never a taxi. <laughs> because a taxi driver will finish the engine of the car, run the engine of the car. And that's what we do with the uh, human beings. We waste them. We finish with them. Or drain them, I should say. And that's when God intercedes with his hand and resurrects you. You with me? Because the God that I'm telling you, I'm talking to you about, is a powerful God. Beyond what you can imagine. Verse 8 says, And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things. Something changes here. All the pain. All the trauma, all confusion, all f fear 
It's over. It's done. There's a song. We haven't sang it here. And years ago, I've sang it in other churches. There's a God. It says you have changed my lamentate in dance. You have striped me with happiness. That's why I come to you. I sing to you. Glory to you. You see? You with me? You see? That happens. When you come to Christ, all that confusion, all that pain dissipates. Everything wants to finish with life, it dissipates. They restore new energy for the words of this man. They turned around and start running. And they run. Verse 10 9 starts. And returning from the sepulchre, and they told these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their, and their words seemed to be them as idle tales to the apostles. In other words, their words, the ladies, the women's words, and they believed them not. God is patient with us. He knows. And there's a lot of things that God says or does that we have a hard time believing. And you know what? There's no problem with that. If you're struggling with something in your life, something in believing with Jesus, there's no problem with that. God's not going to reject you for that. There was a, once a, a man came to Jesus and said, Listen, Jesus, my daughter is sick. I want to believe. But it's hard. You know what Jesus said? It's okay. Walk with me. That's how Jesus treats us. He doesn't reject him. You dummy. You stubborn. No. Walk with me. Be calm. So don't be ashamed if you... I believe this. What I believe... It's a little hard. I believe, you know, what this year. You know, but what everyone that tells me, eh, I have a hard time believing. Which is fine. Jesus is patient. Then verse 12 says, Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and st stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed wondering in himself at what sh at that which was come to pass <laughs> if you dare to walk with Jesus I can guarantee you that you will be marveled may God bless may God keep you